uh, left the Army in 19, basically 1955. I was in the uh, Army Reserve in the 76th Division, which is on Quaker, was on Quaker Lane in West Hartford, and I was in the operations section, basically in charge of summer field training. And uh, then after I was promoted from, uh, to a lieutenant colonel, I lost my job, and I taught uh, courses for the Army War College in uh, Colts Armory. And then I retired in 1966 as a lieutenant colonel. What? Now, you enlisted because you went to West Point. No. No. I did not enlist. I was appointed to West Point by uh, Representative Herman Koppelman, 1942. Uh, I actually, uh, when I was a kid, I used to go to New London. And I really liked to, used to go to the Coast Guard Academy. I really thought I'd like to do that. But the Coast Guard Academy, which now has only got maybe a thousand students, had about 200. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, there were no appointments to that. And academically, I guess I couldn't do the work. So we decided to go to uh, West Point instead. Mm -hmm. uh, and how did you get there? You wrote a letter to the representative? Yeah, well, basically, yeah, I think, I, I don't remember exactly how it all came about. He, uh, they were enlarging my class at the time, so um, he, he was a friend of my father's, and he, he said, well, I have to take a, a test. I think it was very hard. I went to Loomis uh, School. I didn't do very well there, but I went there. And I had this test to take, and, and after I did the test, and I said, oh, I want to go there, et cetera, et cetera, he appointed me. He had several appointments. Uh, I was one. Mm -hmm. In fact, I have an article somewhere around here where it, he lists the appointments that he compliment did uh, at the time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there was another fellow at Loomis who lived in West Harvard named Jack Parker, who's now deceased, who was also appointed. He was appointed by somebody else mm -hmm. who went to West Point. Mm -hmm. So that's why you chose West Point. Yeah, well, I didn't, uh, I thought about, as I think I told you earlier, my cousin graduated in 1939 from West Point. And I don't know, basically I had only talked to him once about it. Uh, he served in the, you know, in the World War II with uh, General Patton. And he told me, well, you know, it was a great place to go and you get a good education and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. So I decided to go there. And you were living in Hartford or West Hartford? West Hartford. Hartford. I always lived in West Hartford. West Hartford. Do you remember the first, uh, first part of the time that you spent at West Point? You can remember all of it. What? All right. <laughs> first part. Okay. Basically, you have to understand that during the war there was the gas rationing. And it wasn't just a simple thing just to hop in your car to go. You really had to plan it out. But what happened to me was we, my parents said, well, we'll have one night last fling and we'll go to New York. And then you can take the train from New York up to West Point, mm -hmm. which was a way a lot of people went. And so we went out and the next morning I got on the train up to West Point and you get lost. If you ever been to West Point, it's very hilly. I mean, you know, it's like climbing Avon Mountain all the time. So the railroad station is at the lowest point. The railroad station is down by the Hudson River. For starters, you have to climb up this to get up to the main campus. You know, it's like, I don't know, climb up big hills. So there I am with my little bag, 17 years old, climbing up this hill. And then of course, as soon as you got up there, everybody started yelling at you, this and that and that. And, and then they put you in formation. And uh, I can't remember, but you went in, they got haircuts. They took all your, cut your hair. They gave you uniforms. And then we all sort of ragtag marched out to this plane where they administered the uh, the oath, the, you know, the, the office, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. on the plane. And that was the beginning. And then what did I do there? Uh, first six weeks you're there, you do basic training, just like any other soldier. You know, that, that's about what it was. We mm -hmm. call it, they call it beast barracks. I mean, you know, it, it was pretty tough. I mean, they yell at you a lot. And mm -hmm. you, don't, you, don't, you don't, it isn't exactly like going to Yale. Mm -hmm. for your orientation and uh, so then when that was over uh, that was uh, I went to July 1st about the middle of August then we went up to a place called it's, it's called Camp Drum now it used to be called Pine Camp and <laughs> I had seen a movie called Five Graves to Cairo I'm never going to forget it where it was about the war in North Africa <laughs> 
the guys were riding in the tanks, and I thought, this is the cat's meow. You're riding in these tanks and going back and forth. So we did. We had maneuvers with these 4th Armored Division, maneuvers of sorts. So, of course, they said, okay, you're going to be a tank commander. So I hop in this uh, vintage tank. I don't think they were, I don't know what the number was anymore. It might be M1 tank or something. I hop in the top, and we start to go down the road, but it's not a paved road, you understand. But there's no... <laughs> There's not much padding on the top of this thing where you're sitting up there with your earphones on. And I banged around. I had the sorest hips you could ever leave. And for, and for one week, I got banged around in the tank. And then, I, obviously, then when the so-called maneuver was over. And most of the people that, the enlisted men that were in this group were older people um, who had been drafted. This is 1943, remember? Mm -hmm. And I don't remember if that unit ever ever went into combat or not. I have I probably did sometime or other, but they were not young people. Uh, I think a lot of them were very unhappy about being drafted, et cetera, et cetera, but they couldn't do much about it. And then come September 1st, you went back to West Point and you went to school. Mm -hmm. And you completed and three you did, years. I did four years and three. Yes. And basically, you went to school, I can't remember, I know you used to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, but I think you went to school from about 8, and I know we used to quit at 3 every day. And, and it was no, like, study periods, there was no, none of that stuff. Uh, the only electives you had when I was there, now you understand now, West Point is the leading, they tell me, the leading college in the United States, with, a, with options and things that you can't believe, mm -hmm. that where you're going to do. My only... Uh, elective was when I got there they said to me well you went to Loomis and you took Spanish and you took French so therefore you can't take Spanish and French so you got two choices Portuguese or German so I took Portuguese and that was it and, and you went to class and then after three o'clock you went out and you did athletics of various sites everybody did something believe me nobody got there was no dead time and then you did that for an hour an hour and a half and then you came back and you showered and then you sat around for a while and then you ate and then you studied and at 10 o'clock you used to go to go to bed as a plebe, you know, and, and uh, it was very rigorous. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the funniest thing of all was when I first got there, uh, when we went to bed at 10 o'clock, my roommate was a fellow who had gone to, I think, the University of Tennessee or somebody for a year before he'd come there. It was different, different. He was like two years older than I was. And he said, this is awful. i got to go to bed at 10 o'clock. I said, I went to a prep school where you went to bed at 930. I said, it's not bad for me. I'm up a half, and a half an hour longer. And that's what I did for the, the year. I didn't do very well, uh, but I passed. And then in the summertime, uh, you went out to what to a uh, like a camp called was called it's called Camp Bruckner now. I think it was had another name then. And you went out there and you did other types of training for uh, uh, the summer. Mm -hmm. It was no you didn't have any actually. When I finished my first year, I did have uh, two weeks off at the end of my first year, mm -hmm. but it was really an academic thing for most of the people because they couldn't go anywhere. And I, I was able to go home and took some kids with, fellas with me. And then we went back uh, and uh, we started in, in, in July. And in July, we went back to training again for two months and then we went back to school again. Okay, the only now, thing, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. The what? The only thing that is sort of interesting, and we were, I was talking about it with my granddaughter the other day, mm -hmm. was that um, the graduation of the class of 1944 was a, Franklin Roosevelt was supposed. I can't verify was supposed to speak because he was going to go up to. He lived in Hyde Park, which is not very far away, and on his way to Hyde Park, he was going to stop off and give a short commencement mm -hmm. address. And the day before, they said the president wasn't coming. They said somebody else. So when the man, the general who was there was making the speech, I can't remember who he was anymore, got up and said his first announcement was that, uh, and, well, I'm talking to you. Our troops are now landing at D-Day. And that's why Roosevelt didn't come, because he was in Washington with the people uh, because of D-Day. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask you now, yeah, sure. when you graduated West Point, mm -hmm. what happened? What happened when I graduated? Yes. I went to basic artillery school mm -hmm. for a year, which was at Fort Sill and Fort Bliss, Texas. Mm -hmm. Then I came back from that. That was uh, from, 
Well, when I graduated, first of all, I was off for a long time because uh, from June 5th, 4th or something to sometime about six weeks because the school didn't start. School started on August. And that's because I was never off at West Point because I went continually and, and had only about 30 days off the whole time I was there. And you get, like the Army, you get 30 days leave time for every year. I'd accumulated this time, but it didn't make any difference because the school didn't start till August 1st in Fort Sill. Mm -hmm. And then I was at, went there for about nine months. And then when I got through with that, I'm trying to think exactly when it was, it was in May, I went home. And then I, and in June of 1947, I went to Japan. And I lived in Japan first in a place called um, Oh God! It was the naval seaplane base. I was in the anti-aircraft then. I lived there. It was it was near Yokohama, uh, and then I was there for a year, and then I moved into downtown Yokohama, and I lived in a, uh, in a well, I call it a rooming house if you want to call it. There was one where the German businessmen were there. German businessmen lived in, called we used to call it the Bund Hotel, and I worked and I was uh, assigned to the staff officer in the, in the 138th uh, uh, Artillery Anti-Aircraft. Mm -hmm. And then I stayed there until December of, uh, well, November of 49. I was basically there two and a half years. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you could, if, if you wanted, you could stay longer. I didn't, uh, it was okay in Japan. It, it's not like it is now. Uh, very heavy curfews. You have to realize that there were hundreds of thousands of Japanese soldiers who were never defeated, still around. And you, it was, you never knew exactly what could happen in certain situations. It so happened after the emperor told them all to quit, there was still a lot of diehard people who basically didn't believe they lost. Just like there were people that you're finding, you used to find in Okinawa coming out 12 years later, you know, coming out of the mm -hmm. woods. But it was okay, and it, it, you know, you have to put up with the uh, fact that they they do their farming with human waste, which makes it like you're in a bathroom all the time, mm -hmm. you know, and without the air spray. And it, it was okay. It, 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 was, it wasn't bad. I mean, I I wasn't married. We had nice officers club and mm -hmm. officers clubs, and I had to belong to a country club there, and uh, and the training. We used to go out and. and um, once a year and fire shells into the um, Bay of Tokyo, so way on the other side of Tokyo Bay, we used to go over there and fire guns out. And it was mostly police action. That was the problem of Korea, it was the troops were drawn down so low that my battalion that I was in, and I was a motor officer, for instance, for a while, and I would have a sergeant as the motor sergeant, and the rest of the people that worked there were all Japanese. There were no soldiers working there. So that was the problem in Korea, which which I don't know whether or not people have told you about or haven't told you about, that when they went into Korea, they were woefully understaffed. The, the, the training, there wasn't enough people to support the troops. Mm -hmm. And there weren't that many troops because they had reduced the army way down at the time from whatever it was to, because the war was over. And uh, it was an unfortunate situation in that these people, there was one division in Korea and I don't think that was on demand, but we basically were mostly doing police work, mm -hmm. guarding the docks, uh, you know, trying to reconstruct Japan. I mean, you have to appreciate that uh, I lived in Tokyo, which was in Yokohama, which wasn't bombed. Tokyo basically some was and some wasn't, but in between the two, which is about 20 miles, was leveled. I mean, leveled, completely leveled. I did a lot of traveling when I was in Japan. I went to Hiroshima, which is, you know, it's, pretty awful to look at. I mean, you're looking at a, a city that isn't there anymore. I mean, it's built now, all rubble. And I went to, uh, traveled around. I, I went to air ground school up in, uh, a glider school up in Sendai. I went to school actually where they, very close to where this, um, the hurricane came. With the hurricane, the tidal waves mm -hmm. and all. Yeah. That, that's where, I was up there, right in that area. That's where, that's where that whole thing was, mm -hmm. up in Sendai. And I went down to Kyushu, and I traveled around and had various odd jobs that took me around to, mm -hmm. around the country. 
And I did a lot of sightseeing. I also went to uh, uh, two things I did do, which is sort of interesting. I, <laughs> we used to like bingo. <laughs> and the bingo prizes were pretty good because the PX has made a lot of money. And General MacArthur ran his own army. He, the PXs there did not participate in the PXs like in the United States. So they made a lot of money, so what, they had to return it to the troops. So they used to do it with various things like bingo games. It was one of you know, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So one day, a friend of mine won the first prize at the bingo game. And the first prize was a two, <coughs> it was a trip to Shanghai for two people on Air France. Now, it seems like it'd be a fortune, but it wasn't a fortune. I mean, maybe the whole thing was worth 500 bucks at the most. So we went to Shanghai, the two of us, flew on Air France, took a long time. Got to Shanghai in, um, February of 1949. It was February, yeah, February. Go to Shanghai and uh, it was very nice. We did some sightseeing. Uh, read the newspapers. According to the newspapers, the Chinese, Chai Chen Shek's government was winning the war. According to the newspapers. Then we went looking at, which was an unique thing, and I never even thought about it by my fellow I was with. It, uh, during World War Two, before World War II, a lot of uh, German Jews were taken by the Japanese to Shanghai. And uh, we thought we would go look and see if we could find where they were. Well, the guide we had said there were two groups of Jews that came. Some came from Russia in 1922, and some came from Germany in 1937 or wherever they came. But the Japanese, when they took over Shanghai, you know, uh, after they occupied it, had moved the Jewish people to another area completely because they had nice apartments and then they took them over and moved them somewhere else and when we went to look mm -hmm. we couldn't find anything. Mm -hmm. the yeah. Next, yeah. Now I, I don't mean to in interrupt sure. you but we're going to edit this, this part out but uh, you were talking earlier about how you ended up in the service you extended your time in the service that you were going to leave and your father convinced yeah, you right. to well, Yeah, right. Could you explain that? I got one more story to tell you. Okay. Okay, now in April of 1949, my mother has, uh, was a Girl Scout leader in Hartford. Mm -hmm. She had a very good friend who happened to end up being the uh, Girl Scout uh, work for MacArthur, reorganizing the Girl Scouts in Japan. And that way I did get to meet the Empress of Japan at a tea one time at her house. And then she said to me that they wanted to take a trip to Bangkok. She had special arrangements, so it was a very nice trip. But they needed a man to do the, to go to these countries to do the luggage and stuff like that. He didn't want three women, there were three women and myself. We flew on an embassy courier plane, which was a very deluxe little plane for the time. We went to Bangkok. We stopped other places, but we went to Bangkok. We're in Bangkok, sitting in the Oriental Hotel with the wall fan going on and hot as the dickens, it's humid. And we did some sightseeing, and then we were there for two days, and then came the assistant uh, military attache and said to us, um, you, you've got to leave because they're having a civil war. I said, what kind of civil war? I said, I don't see a civil war. He said, well, the army's shooting at the Navy in these rivers out here, and we, it, we, we can't afford to have you here. So we flew from there to Hong Kong. And we got to Hong Kong, and it was fine. And uh, I looked in the streets. It's like New York City, a million people in the streets. So then we went up to the hotel, and I got up at night. I looked out, and the same people were in the streets. So the next morning, I said to somebody, I said, how come all these people are still in the streets? He said, oh, these are all the people that had fled mainland China to Hong Kong, had no place to stay. They just were in the streets, sleeping in the streets. So that's my last story about that, that you know. But, it, uh, it, you know, everything has changed over there. Hong, Hong Kong was a very interesting place to visit, and as was Shanghai, and was Bangkok. And I, I also took a trip partially around the world. I went to the Philippine Islands, Okinawa, I went to Guam. I've been at Midway Island, you know, in Hawaii, so I, I saw quite a few things, you know. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we'll go back to what you want to talk no, about. No, I, I, I wanted to, um, you to explain 
Uh, did you retell the story for the camera of how you ended up in uh, Korea? Well, I didn't end up in Korea, and that's another thing, another story too. Basically, I didn't end up in Korea. I, I ended up in Fort Meade, Maryland, with a fairly cushy little job, not too taxing, summertime, and it was everything was done. It was very nice. And uh, basically what happened was my father, I said to my father, well, I can resign now legally and get out of the army. He said, why don't you wait till September and then resign because the insurance schools in Hartford don't start until October. And there's no point you're coming home here. What would you do? You, you know what I mean? I have to get, <laughs> I have to learn the insurance business and the summertime is not the time to come home. So I stayed <laughs> and then the war started and I was stuck so I you know and actually my class at West Point unlike any other class they ever had managed to avoid everything we avoided World War II basically because of the way I was programmed you don't understand that uh, you, there's a set it's not a hit or miss deal you have a certain program you do a certain amount of time at one school, then you did the Japan. I served with the troops in Japan. Then I came back and I was in the unit for a year. And then they said to me, uh, now you're going to go back to school. So I went back to the advanced artillery school. Oh, no, I'm sorry, to radar school. That's where I went first, to radar school. Because you had to learn all these things. I mean, I had been to everything. I've been to Cooks and Baker School. I've been to Motor Maintenance School. This is all part of a, of a, of a program for, for the regular Army officers. So I then I went out to radar school at Fort Bliss, Texas, and I uh, finished that in I think '51. And then they said, "Okay, now you have to go back, and we have basic training. You're going to for six months. You are going to run two cycles of basic training, and you'll be in charge of a basic training company, which is a real chore because you have to realize that the these are the people who come in from civilian life who either got drafted or whatever it was." Most of them very unhappy to be there to start with. Some of them not very bright, you know, and you ran through basic training with them, the whole basic training cycle. The same thing I did at West Point when I first went there for six weeks. So I did that. So when I finished that, then they said, okay, now it's your turn to teach school. You'll teach the, at the radar school. So then I had an option to go to, instead of teaching, I said, well, maybe I should, I'd like to go to, it was brand new, something exciting, was guided missiles. The things you see going on now that you take for routine, and it was comical, but I could go to guided missile school, which was in uh, White Sands, New Mexico. And at that time, I was able to go where the atomic bomb was developed and all that stuff was over there. So I went over there and uh, started to go to school there and then decided that this was for MIT graduates, not me. The, mm -hmm. But, it, but it, the, these missiles that we watched were, you know, are so primitive, you, you, you'd laugh. I mean, you know, uh, they're, but anyway, so then I said, okay, I'm not gonna do this. So I said, I'll go back and I'll teach radar school. So I did that for a while till 1950, get the dates right, 53, 53, 52 rather, 52. But another year, another piece taught. Then they said to me, okay, now you got to go back to school again. So I went to the advanced artillery school. And that was from 52 to 53. That was another September through, I mean, that's what I was telling you. Mm -hmm. and I went to the, that, and that course was sort of interesting because um, unlike the basic one, uh, we had, if there were 100 of us in the class, probably 30 were foreign officers, which were very interesting talking to them, et cetera, et cetera. People from Brazil and Guatemala, England, Sweden, uh, were going to artillery school. And uh, then when I finished up, I told, I don't know if it on the record or not, then when I finished up, they had this big rush to get to Korea, mm -hmm. and I opted to go to an air ground school thing, and then I got to the West Coast, and then they finally, I, I finally got to Korea, and I told you I had to go, get, and I was in Korea, and nothing much was going on because there was a truce. I mean, the, the, the truce was gonna take effect in less than two months. There was no purpose in doing any real military activity to do anything, to capture anything, because you had this demilitarized zone. 
I mean, the Marines used to go out and do some kind of stuff at night. I don't know what they used to do on some hill that we used to say, because the Marines, we were, I, my unit, the 25th Division, the Marines were attached to them. They were in my fire direction center. And they used to go out and they used to do all kinds of malarkey and shoot, shoot up nothing at night. <clears throat> but they used to, we used to operate for them. And then in the morning they'd come back. And so there wasn't really, it was just a, 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 you know, a down period. The only thing was I did go over to Pamunjan when they repatriated some of my, a couple of my classmates that were captured, two of them were captured. Uh, fortunately, they were not captured for very, they were captured quite a long while ago, but because of the Red Cross or something over there, they were not as badly treated as most of the people were. And don't ask me why. I mean, they, they were, didn't look good when they came back, but they looked a lot better than some of the other people. And then the, then the truce was on, and then all we did then was uh, hope that some idiot didn't come over and, you know, bomb us or something, uh, which could happen. It did happen once uh, where a uh, North Korean MiG came over and uh, actually he was doing target practice over on, the, on his side and for some reason he something happened and he got blown off course and he ended up shooting some rounds in, in, in a field right near where we were. And then nine UN people came to apologize, etc., etc., etc. But but basically, there was nothing doing. The biggest problem you had was to keep the troops busy. And uh, in the winter time, particularly, and I was on the warm side of Korea. Uh, my mother used to worry. She used to read the temperatures all the time. And I said, "Well, Mom, it, it gets to be about ten below in the middle of the night, and I'm I'm in a bunk, I'm in a bunker, or I'm in a trailer, or I'm in a Quonset hut, and." Uh, I'm in a sleeping bag. I'm not outside running around in my underwear. Now the other side of Korea, which was desolate, you used to get 30 degrees below them because it's very mountainous, you know, and, and, and where we were. And um, so basically, we did, we did, we did, we used to go down and, and, and do exercises and fire the guns and uh, do training and so forth. And, and then the units get pared down. And was the biggest problem was keeping the troops busy. And we had a lot of entertainment. We we have to remember the officers' club never closed. There was no uh, there was no like you know open up the bar at five o'clock business. The bar was open twenty four hours a day because you work twenty four hours a day. I used to work uh, in my fire director center because I was in charge of it, which would work twenty four hours a day. I used to go to work at about ten in the morning and probably quit when the next shift came on. So I was there for every shift that we had. I had lieutenants that used to run the shifts actually and I was in charge of them mm -hmm. and then I had the British were there uh, they were attached to us and a very <laughs> a very pompous British colonel was in charge of artillery and uh, I made up stories about him later on uh, the only reason he ever talked to me because he had gone to Sandhurst was because I went to West Point if I had gone to West Point he would never even talk to me he, he was I mean he you think of Colonel Blimp or something like that? That was him. He had a, a bat, bat, Batman, which would be an aide, you know, running around a, a corporal. I mean, the, it was unbelievable uh, the way he used to act. Not, tell me, he told me a lot of stories about he was older, you know, he was a, about being in India prior to World War II and how the, the, there was such enormous wealth. They used to come on New Year's Day, and the Maharajas came here, and the uh, British Army came here, and stuff like that. Then we had the Marine were with us, and we had the Turks were with us. The Turks had a, a division in Korea, but they didn't replace it. It was very small, and they came, and they all operated out of our uh, out of our little fire director centers. I talked to these people, uh, and uh, it, it, it was okay. I mean, you know, I was not unhappy to leave. When you know, I, then I did resign. Uh, I had been promoted to major, and I knew that once I got back to the United States, I get demoted. Be, I was promoted major. That was the job. It was the major's job. I'd be demoted because the army was going back down again. They build up during the Korean War, going to go back down again. And then at the time, I said, "Well, uh, I said I resigned, and I had to go through a gauntlet of officers who interviewed me why I was resigning." including Maxwell Taylor, who was the superintendent at West Point when I was there, and he was just disappointed, and I explained to him that I didn't think the 
the future of the junior officers in the Army was very bleak. And he didn't disagree. He said, but you know, we, you're, you're very highly educated from the schools you went to and so forth and so on. He said, and we hate to lose people who are highly trained. I said, well, I decided I'm going to do something else. And that was the end of it. He was very nice about it. And then I took a trip. <clears throat> I came home and my a friend of mine said to me, well, I got a great thing for us to do. Again, it was summertime. And I couldn't go in the insurance business in the summertime. I did. Was, I got there in June, or the beginning of June, and it was at the end of June. He said, why don't we take this trip? It's a great trip on a freighter, on a, an army freighter. I said, it's going to go places we had never been before. I, I said, I, well, we said, we're going to go the other way home. I said, that sounds okay to me. We hopped on the freighter, accommodations were fine. And we sailed, I went uh, through the Indian Ocean and I went up the Suez Canal. I never got off the darn thing. We got stopped once at a British base in the, in the Indian Ocean. I can't remember the name of it now, for a while. Uh, it picked up stuff and took stuff off and went through the Suez Canal. I said, oh my goodness, there'll be a chance for me to sightsee in Egypt because we're gonna stay there. Got to Port Sayed, Sayad, and we're about to get off and all of a sudden up shows up the military, old military attache shows up, said can't come because they had that exact time I was there, there was the overthrow of somebody. I can't remember, it was, I don't know if it was King Farouk got overthrown or Nasser got overthrown, I can't remember anymore. All I know is I didn't get off the boat. Went through the Mediterranean, stopped in Gibraltar, that was okay. They went up to Bremerhaven on this boat. This took a, a month, you have to understand, on a freighter. It was not like going on the Queen Mary and you got off in Bremerhaven and I flew home. And that was it. And then, of course, I went down through the to Fort Dix down here to get discharged. The Army is very slow moving, and they didn't have the paperwork exactly right. And I had a lot of leave time accumulated because it, in Korea it didn't count. I mean, I did go to Japan on R and R, but it didn't count. So again, you know, I had maybe two months off. But because they kept calling me back for more paperwork at Fort Dix, and I stayed at Fort Dix for about two weeks processing all of this stuff. Um, then uh, I had all this time off and then they sort of screwed up my reserve thing and I had to go back again and by the time I got done with my leave time and everything else I finally got really got off the payroll. Then then they paid you, it was some career, there was some kind of bonus system they had where you got paid again for another couple of months. I didn't get out until March of 1955. I didn't get out of, really get out of the Army. Mm -hmm. and, uh, finally, I was already in the reserve here in West Hartford. I was still in the reserve in West Hartford and getting discharged from the Army over here on the, uh, in, in, you know, in 55. And how long were you in the reserve? I stayed in the reserve for, well, I stayed in the reserve till 1966. I put my 20 years in, and again, it was another dead end situation. Actually, uh, I was erroneously, if they erroneously, I was promoted to colonel because they did this in the National Guard to get the people bigger pensions, actually. They promoted people when they retired, so I got promoted to colonel. So they said to me, well, I said, how come? So they didn't have a good explanation. They said, well, I had gone, while I was in the reserve, I had gone to the, uh, I got it in the garage, uh, to command staff college, command and general, general staff college. And I was, let's quote unquote, honor graduate. That's no big deal, but that's what it was. And because of that, I said, but I was only a lieutenant colonel from nine, it usually takes oh, six or seven years to go from lieutenant colonel in the reserve to colonel. And I was promoted to lieutenant colonel in 51. I wouldn't even been eligible by my count until 57 or 67 or 68. He said, oh, they took two years off because you were an honor graduate. Then about two years ago, you don't believe this, two years ago I got a letter from the Department of the Army that uh, I had been demoted <laughs> back to lieutenant colonel which it didn't make any difference because my pension, as they worked my pension out, it made no, virtually no difference in the money in my particular situation at all. Mm -hmm. And so they demoted me. So I ended up as a lieutenant colonel. But I've been out of that, you know, it's hard to believe. I mean, I've been retired for 45 years. And I've been out of West Point 65 years. Mm -hmm. And I'm still here. But I'm one of the younger ones in my class. You have to appreciate there are some people in my class, I'm gonna be 86 in a couple of weeks, that are probably almost 90 years old. I have people who served in the army for two or three years. I have people that have gone to college for two or three years. You know, they were in my class. I think of the 875 that graduated, I would have been in the lowest, youngest 10%. Mm -hmm. There were a few people younger, but not a lot. 
Now, I wanted to ask you, when you were in Korea talking about entertaining, did you see any of the USO shows? Oh, yeah. Well, Doris Day, no Marilyn Monroe, she wouldn't come up there. Marilyn Monroe only went to the high profile places. Mm -hmm. Our t t t <laughs> the, 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 the 25th Division Artillery was not a sexy place to be. The 40th Division was a sexy place or the, some other places. But anyway, no, I never saw her. Doris Day, the Bell Sisters were one. I'm trying to think of there were. I probably went to about, we had maybe five or six shows that I went to. I, I really didn't care that much, but you know, they were, we had an amphitheater in our, in our area where we used to show movies at night and that's where they used to perform, but everybody used to come. And um, I could sit in the front row, but it was okay, you know, if they wanted, if they, uh, they came. And they were very nice. Doris Day was particularly nice. Doris Day ate in the officers' club with us, and she was very good. The other people, they'd come in and they'd go. The USO ran it. There was a lot of them. I'll tell, tell you, the other guy who came, who did come, was that Jerry Colonna. He was with Bob Hope, and he came once Bob Hope never, Bob Hope used to come with a big group, and then fan out. He would go one place. He'd probably have twenty entertainers with him. I can't remember all of them. And he used to come all the time. And then these guys would various pieces of his show would come up and come. So they, yeah, I saw quite a few shows. We had movies. I mean, it, it wasn't you know it was not very sexy over there. I got to tell you, it was not you know I can't give you a hand to hand combat. Nobody, I don't have any bottle bottle scars. And, uh, I don't have any uh, Japanese flags. I have a lot of Japanese ivory here, some Japanese prints over there that I got. I traveled a lot in Japan, went to Bikimoto's Pearl Farm, got some pearls, mm -hmm. which is another arduous task. Now, the, yeah. um, uh, what exactly did you do after uh, you came back from Korea? You started the... Um, when, I was in, when, when I retired? Yeah. Oh, when I left the Army? No, my father and I had an insurance agency. And I went with my father in the casualty insurance business, and I was in the life insurance business. Mm -hmm. I was with my father for, partner of my father for 34 years. Mm -hmm. And I say one thing because I never asked him any questions, we never had a fight, because he was always right. And then, <clears throat> by default only, uh, my family was in the tobacco business, the Harvard Tobacco Company. We used to grow tobacco, leaf tobacco here, in Bloomfield, Windsor, Enfield, South Windsor, Manchester, we had farms, and it was a public health company, and my cousin, who was the chair of the board, had developed cancer, and frankly, um, so he said to me at the time, everybody, it's sounded about pretty old, and I'd like you to go on the board. Now, I never worked in tobacco fields, actually, I worked in the scrap metal business, believe it or not, during the war it's, uh, in Hartford. My grandfather didn't want me in the tobacco fields for a lot of reasons. First of all, it's very hard work, and second of all, the grandson of the president of the company should be in the tobacco fields. So I never knew anything about that, much about it. But we had gone out of the tobacco business in 1970, uh, let me see, 77 was the last time we grew tobacco. Uh, I can't remember what the reasons were. We didn't do it anymore. I think it had to do with the minimum wage or or we used to do peace work against minimum wage. I don't remember. I was not that interested. My father was a vice president of the company on the board of directors. Then they decided to go in the vegetable business, which unfortunately we had the hurricane. Was it in 79? We had the hurricane here, I think. Mm -hmm. Ella Grasso was the governor, I remember, and it wiped out our most of our crop. And so they decided to liquidate the company. And at that time, my cousin had gotten cancer and we had a lot of problems with directors of family, any family company in about the third generation fights with each other. So he decided that he would, I would do, take his place, his brother become chairman of the board of the company and or president chairman of the board, and he was also, and I become treasurer of the company. And so from 1980, about 79, till we finally liquidated the company, which took forever, till 1992, it took, well we sold the land, and we had problems with environmentalists and, and a lot of the land was sold on, um, on deferred payment plans, you know, and that kind of stuff to various developers. And we had other properties that we owned from years ago when they took Route 84, they took our tobacco land and they owned properties and 
So we, uh, I did that too, part time, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And the only other thing was I, I was a director of Mechanics Bank at the same time. Now, so I, that's what I did. I, I don't mean to interrupt you. I Go keep, ahead. I keep in, in, interrupting you. Um, you can interrupt me all you want. Um, did your military experience influence your thinking about the war or war in general? You mean, well, I don't understand what you're talking about. Okay. Um, after what you went through, through West Point yeah, and, right. yeah, and yeah. everything, did that have an impact on how you thought about war? About war? Yes. I love watching war movies. I tell you, I watch the military channel all the time because it brings back old memories to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Battle of Britain, uh, my roommate, I like to tell you, my roommate at Loomis was an Englishman who came to Loomis in the fall of uh, 1940 and had been through the battle you know, here's a guy who's 16 years old, and he was in London when every night they, he went to a, to an air raid shelter. I mean, you think about that a little bit, you know. But not really. Um, I, I like, I, I know the history. I, I, I like history. I, I mean, I, I know about the war in Europe. I know about MacArthur. Of course, MacArthur was a different ballgame anyway because he, he was an egomaniac to start with and brilliant man and you knew exactly what you saw plenty of stuff about what he did in the Pacific a whole planning of the retaking of all the islands etc cetera, etc cetera, the Battle of the Coral Sea in fact I just saw that on the military channel I remember that and how we finally the Navy finally figured out that the battleships were gone there was no more battleships it was aircraft carriers and uh, so I don't know I, I, I am interested in that most people think I'm pretty boring because they didn't do anything about it. And I spent a lot of time there in the Army. That's one of the reasons I went in the Reserve, because I was really a sort of, not so annoyed, but I sort of got stuck. And, I, and a friend of my father's, who was the Judge Advocate General of the 76th Division, said, geez, we'd like to have Sam come down there. He's been so long, he only has to do 10 more years, 11 more years, I mean, and, and, and you qualify for a pension. You don't collect your money then, but you qualify. You don't get your money in the Reserve until you're 60 years old, mm -hmm. you know? so. That's what I did. Now, I'd like you to talk about your citations. Well, now, now we get into the sore point. Now, now we get into the part where you had said you wanted to be interviewed. You would be willing to okay. be interviewed to set the record straight. Okay. I got in a ribbon at West Point uh, for the American Theater ribbon. It's in here. Because of that, in the state of Connecticut, I am considered a World War II veteran. I find it very embarrassing because I really don't consider being in school at West Point really being a World War II veteran. A World War II veteran to me is a guy that I don't care where he was in. But I could be in Nassau for all I care, or in Europe, or in the United States, in an Army base, or in the Panama, but not, I don't consider being at West Point, being a World War II veteran. Mm -hmm. I make no progress with the Secretary of State's office who does all this stuff. And a year ago, I got a great big certificate uh, thanking me for my service in World War II. And my service at World War II was going to school. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. and so it was embarrassing. The other ribbons are, are uh, occupation of Japan, uh, service ribbon for the Victory Medal, uh, Korea uh, Medal for serving in Korea, and I got a couple of others from uh, I can't remember what they were. And then uh, when I left Japan, everybody got something, so they gave me a accommodation ribbon for running this fire direction center and a small parade. You got a parade. Yeah, a little parade. Minor league. We, we were a small unit. We had a little band. The division artillery had a little band of about 16 people. And they prayed around the thing. We had a big parade. little parade. Give me the medal. And uh, that was it. Now you also have... Uh... Oh, then the other thing in here. Yeah. The other thing that my, every, my family just think, thinks is really funny, like summer camp. When you're at West Point, you've got to do... Either you qualify in a pistol and, and, be, and basically training a pistol and the rifle and the carbine. So when you get done with doing it, the National Rifle Association sends you a little thing like this, see? I mean, you could, you, now there's many more you could go on there. They're expert, expert not. They see they can they go like this, but I only got this far. So I, I have this thing and, and my kids think it's very humorous. It's like you get these at summer camp when you from the National Rifle Association. I got it at West Point, that was all. So that's, that's the awards. Now, are you a member of a 
Veterans Organization. No, I told you, the only thing I belong to is the Reserve Office Association mm -hmm. and the 25th Division Association. That's all. I, I don't participate in any Veterans Association. I go, once in a while I go to a meeting or something, but I, I just, uh, I, I don't, I have no war stories to swap. I want to talk about what, what kind of war story? Uh, that I, uh, let's see, I took a boat trip from West Point to Baltimore, Maryland in 1944 to go to the Army-Navy football game. We went by sea, believe it or not. And I'll tell you, I never saw anything like it in my life. You know, remember, the war is still on. It's the fall of 1944. They had the Army-Navy game was in Baltimore. They decided we'd go by ship. We went by ship, and if we had eight destroyers watching us, they had a hundred. I never saw an armada escorting us down and up Chesapeake as we did mm -hmm. at that time. And then we paraded through Baltimore and went to the game. Got off the boat and got back on the boat. We won the game, went back up to West Point. Now you were you were telling me before we went on camera that um, when you were at West Point, you saw film of what was happening. Well, yeah, that was one of the things that they did in tactics. We used to call it tactics. Uh, don't bother to answer them. I'll just let it ring. Oh. Well, we had like, we called it tactics, and every after, about three times a week, because that was our business, we would come and we would watch the films that were sent over from Europe and from uh, the Far East. They would show us what we were doing. And they took a lot of movies. There were a lot of Army photographers. I mean, we saw the Battle of the, I mean, I see these movies again on the Military Channel. They had just had one on of the Battle of the Coral Sea. I remember seeing that movie. That was the end, that was the end of, um, uh, battleships because they sunk them all and then that was the turning point of World War II in, in the Pacific that's when they destroyed most of the Japanese Navy but anyway and so we would have the war in Europe a lot from General Patton because he went fast he had a lot of cameramen he liked being on camera all these pictures you see of him directing traffic are true he used to stand up I guess and he used to get out of his Jeep and as the tanks went by he would be, he would be directing traffic and yelling at the troops because that's what he used to do, you know. He uh, he was, you know, unfortunately he was a very good when the war was on. Not so good when the war was over, but unfortunately he died in an automobile accident in 1945. So, but he he was a, uh, you know. And then we saw movies of you know of, uh, I told you the concentration camps, the Battle of the Bulge. Um, a lot, a lot of film of um, uh, the Air Force films of bombing of uh, various places, uh, uh, the oil fields in uh, Romania. I mean, every day there was an endless flow of things. Then we, then we would discuss the tactics, like the Battle of the Bulge. That so we'd show us the movies. Then we would get out the big wall maps and show us how Patton came up from here and Montgomery came from here, and and then how we stopped them and we pushed them back. And how they river crossings. I mean, you know, it get pretty. It, a lot of people run around. A lot of shooting. I mean, these were these were camera these um, military photographers who did a great job. They were right with the troops, taking those pictures. I'd like to ask you some yeah. other questions. How did you stay when you were uh, later on after West Point? How did you stay in touch with your family? Did you write them? Come to my phone. I'll tell you a story about that too. Yeah, my family. I mean, I only got my sister and myself. Yeah, I write, write to them, talk them on the phone. The, the best story, when I was in Korea uh, in July, AT&T announced they were now being able to hook up a telephone service from Pusan, uh, not Pusan, I'm sorry, Seoul to the United States. And for five bucks, I think it was two bucks for the enlisted and five bucks for the officers, you could call home for five minutes. And they had special places, I, I hate to say this, but there were special places for the officers to go and special places for the listed men to go. So I went down, and they had a lot of phones, and I, so I dialed home. And the phone rang, the phone rang, the phone rang, and nobody answered. So I said, you know, I made the schlep down to Seoul. I mean, it's a 20-minute trip that takes an hour and a half down a bumpy road. I said, I'll call my sister, because that's, I had her phone number. So I called my sister. My father answered the phone. And I said, what are you doing in Philadelphia? That was usually in Philadelphia. I said, oh, he said, she just had a baby. It was the day after my birthday, actually. It was the 15th of, well, I don't know on the days, but it was the 15th of July. 
And so that phone call went through and I talked to my father on the phone. Then uh, as things got more sophisticated, actually, I ended up from my own office in Korea. But with a complicated thing, I could call my mother and father. I had to watch the time all the time because you've got time zone changes. And, and I used to say to my mother, you know, it cost me, at that time, I think the cost went down. I said, but you know, you can't, I got a three minute phone call. You can't spend the first two minutes asking me what day of the week it is and how cold it is or how warm it is. And so I used to call up two or three times. But I was, I was in touch with them and write them letters. Oh, good. Now, what, when you were uh, over there, what was the food like? Where? In Korea. Food was, well, I ate in the officer's club. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, again, you have a situation in the Far East Command where the PX profits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, stay in the unit in Japan or in Korea or in Japan. It, it was not distributed through the United, through the whole system. So we had a huge amount of extra money. Remember, drinks in Korea uh, were probably, I would say, 15 cents a drink. And then my officer's club made about a nickel a drink on that. And we drank quite a bit, quite a few people drink. And then the listed men's clubs also, you know, did very well. And so consequently, we had a lot of surplus money. So the, our cook, we were near Pamujan. We were seven miles away. Pamujan was the UN headquarters, had a very big commissary for these people. So when the menu came up, there was something that wasn't very pleasant because we had money. We would dispatch the cook over to Pamujan and he would come back with, uh, he could come back with uh, steak, lobster tails, whatever they had over there in there because they, they lived pretty well. So therefore the food in the main was very good mm -hmm. uh, because we had the ability to supplement our food, but in the main, not bad. The food wasn't bad. The uh, funny thing was, and I don't drink beer, was the big deal where they gave all the soldiers these, uh, I think, like 4.2 beer or something, very light, very low alcohol content in little cans, and they gave them all like three or four of them a day, you know, to, to drink for nothing. But uh, the food situation was okay. Uh, food Japan was all right when I was there. You know, uh, but of course nothing was grown in Korea. Everything was imported. But, but I never had any problems. I'm not that big an eater. I'm not a gourmet eater. You know. Now, did you feel un particularly under pressure when uh, you were serving? Did you feel pressured with the responsibilities? Not really. No, I, I never really thought that. I, I, you know, I knew my business. So I never had to worry about it. And then I was only supervised by, basically in Korea, I was supervised by nobody. And in other words, I ran the fire director center. The battalion commander didn't know much about how to run a fire director center, to be honest with you. He never did it. And his assistant never did it. So basically, they couldn't come down and find fault with what I was doing because they didn't know what I was doing anyway. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. And it's not a hard thing to do. I mean, it, basically what it is, if you're, is, is I have massive charts with every known target within our range in North Korea. And all the guns are set so that if I want to engage a target, I would just give them a number and they would do this number and they could shoot up the target. It wasn't a hard thing to do because we had it all plotted. I've been plotted out for years. And of course, we never used it because we never shot there. <laughs> because I was never in combat to shoot. All we did, basically, was at night, was to go and fire up the ammunition because one, it was gonna become obsolete, and two, it was very heavy to load back on the trucks. And we decided we would shoot it up. Now, I don't have here anymore because my wife gave it away. Uh, my unit fired, it's hard to believe, my battalion, the 8th Field Artillery Battalion, fired a half million rounds in Korea. We had been, they're documented. We have books. You keep track of all the rounds. And we fired eight of them at one time, eight or 12, and then had them made into, took the shells and had them uh, silver coated and, and engraved. And we gave one to I don't know, all the higher ups. That's what we did. And I had one. And I, I had mine made into a lampshade. And, and I had it in my house for a while. And then it wore, wore off. And so I didn't like it very much in the first place. I mean, having a lampshade out of an artillery shell. 
So we find a lot of shells. We find a lot of, I mean, they, they were in Korea a long time. The other embarrassing thing in Korea, for me, was we were attached to the 27th Infantry Regiment. The 27th Infantry Regiment, you probably knew no beans about, but they were in Korea with the 24th, when they, you know, things were terrible in Korea. You know that, they were almost pushed into the ocean. They were down, they held the line at Pusan. There was a reporter for the Herald Tribune, and I think her name was Marguerite Higgins, who wrote up big glowing articles about the 27th Infantry Regiment who held the line and the Brigadier General who was in charge. And because of that, we got numerous, we got two citations. We got a Korean presidential citation and they got a, a government uh, unit citation from the president like they just gave to the SEALs, the Army, the SEALs that did the thing there, that presidential citation. Well, those are big lanyards you wear around your shoulders. You see, that's what they are. So if you're attached to that regiment like I was, though you had nothing to do with anything, you had to wear these two lanyards. You look like a, um, uh, I should be carrying bags at some hotel, you know, with a, with a thing on. So it was very, that was another embarrassing thing that we used to get. And then people used to come to see this regiment. I mean, visitors, you know, politicians, Governor Dewey came one time, uh, Governor Earl Warren came to, to visit this regiment. They came over to see other units, New York unit, New York National Guard, or California National Guard. They'd all come to see this unit. <laughs> the people who did all the heroic work are long gone. <laughs> they were just a bunch of draftees like everybody else. But, uh, you know, that, now, was there anything special you did for good luck? You didn't carry a rabbit foot. No, no. In fact, in fact, the only thing I did do for good for common sense was since we did a lot of climbing up these hills, and they're very, very, and they're very steep. My father had a twenty-five caliber Colt pistol from World War One, and I kept it with me all the time. I couldn't shoot from here to there, but I looked up the requirements for a um, sidearm. Every officer had to carry a sidearm. It didn't specify I had to carry a Colt 45 or this 25. 25 was a little gun like this. Mm -hmm. But when you used to climb up the mountains over there, that little gun weighed a thousand pounds. And your little swagger stick that we all had to carry weighed a hundred pounds before the time you walked up these hills. So I used to carry that little gun with me all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Now did you, uh, do you recall any particularly Humorous or uh, events or an unusual event you well all right uh, uh, I, well there are two tragic things one was tragic one was humorous Sigmund Rhee who was the president of Korea was like all the other presidents of all these other countries I mean he's president but he's really you could substitute dictator in the same words so in when I was up where we were in the demilitarized zone there was nobody living. But people used to live there, and they had congressional districts. It's like having nobody living in Hartford, just the, the you know the state house, and nobody's here. And so now you have to go register to go run for re-election. You have to go down to the state house. Well, they had a little house in this field. We used to call it a re-house, a, a little building, probably as big as this room, in the building which which housed all the records, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, I gather for this congressional district or whatever they call it. So one day, a man comes all dressed up in like a tuxedo practically, he comes into our area and said he wanted to go to the, would we take him to the, uh, this building? This building was patrolled by Korean Marines patrolling the building, the, the guard of the building. So we never thought that was unusual. So. I don't know, we didn't have a problem, so we we said no. And the man never got to go to the building. The reason he wanted us to go take him to the building is because if they saw the American troops, they might let him go in and register to run for re-election. And he was an opponent of Sigmund Rees. So that's how that worked. Then another time, I looked out in the field, nearby right where this thing was, I see two little kids out in this field. And there's a big signs in this field, uh, you know, could be mine, please, you know, keep off. Now these two kids are out playing in it, so we know what the heck to do. How I got there, we had no idea. So my sergeant said to me, well, we'll get them. 
and we'll go out. Now, when you go to probe for mines, you take a bayonet and you go on your hands and you probe into the ground to see if you hit. So these two guys probed into the ground, and these people are, and you remember, you gotta go on your knees, probe into the ground 300 yards out into this field to get these two kids. Well, they get out there, and they get the two kids, and they walk back where they came, and then when we got done, I said, you know, this is pretty good, and the colonel said, gee, that's a very heroic act these guys did, and I gave them the soldier's medal, which is a medal that you do for non-combat stuff. About <laughs> two months later, for reasons, I saw a bunch of Korean trucks, army trucks out there, and we, they ran out waving their arms, waving their arms, and one of the interpreters came out and said, oh, oh, we forgot to tell you. He said, "This we cleaned all the mines out of this two years ago, we forgot to take the sign down. So I thought that was pretty good, but we didn't take back the soldiers, that was because they didn't know it wasn't mine. But there were, you know, humorous things. Now, what, what did you think of uh, your fellow officers and enlisted men? Fine. I never had any problems. You know, it's a hard thing to, to, to define. Uh, you know, I was a major, and, and, then, and there was only two people above me, basically, in the battalion. I never had any problem. I never had any problems, basically, by religion or anything. Uh, part of it probably is because my name didn't in a vowel, and half the people thought I was Italian. Uh, the uh, it's like an MIT graduate engineer, all right. And he's now he's working with all these other engineers from Central Connecticut, the engineer, but he's like an elitist engineer, you know, because he went to MIT. Well, that's the way I was. I was in like a group. I mean, in other words, we, we used to get together. Everybody was pretty enamored with the fact that, you know, that I went to West Point. And I never had any problems. I mean, I never had any problems with the troops. I mean, I never had anybody tell me to go to hell. You know, I was pretty easy going. I mean, I used to play cards with these guys, and and, and, and we had a good time. You know, I played gin or played poker. I will say that, uh, I'm trying to think of another poker story. Uh, my sergeant, who, was a, who had been a um, graduate. Now, I can't remember whether he went to University of Houston or Texas Christian. I can't remember where he graduated. He was graduated. He was a, a master sergeant. Very smart kid. And uh, they had a thing called soldier savings, which you, one, one, you used to pay 4% interest for the soldiers, you know. And then every month he would say to me, uh, I would encourage soldier savings. I would talk to the troops about it. And then we'd collect the money and we'd put them in envelopes. And I'd send it away, get the, like going to the bank, except I was in charge of it. For, the, for my unit, for this group. Now, and every month he would give me a amount of money far in excess of what he got paid. So I used to say to him, uh, how come? And he said to me, well, the guys are very poor poker players. And honest to God, he, it was amazing. I mean, he didn't get paid very much then. I mean, my pay was sort of unusual. I mean, my pay started at 150 bucks a month. When I was a major in Korea, not including the combat pay, was only for a couple of months. That's all. That was peanuts anyway. Uh, I think, including everything, I think I got paid seven hundred. It was like seven hundred thirty bucks a month. That's what I got paid. Think about that a little bit. But then again, too, as somebody said, when I came back, you also bought a car for two thousand dollars. So things are a little different. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it really was un, un, unbelie unbelievable. But that you know, you didn't get paid much in the in the beginning. Now, did you keep any kind of a diary or notes or anything? Nope. No. 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 I just remember, I, I, I it, it, keeping a diary in Korea would have been pretty boring. Didn't do anything. I mean, basically, literally, you got up in the morning, and I went down to work, and and then they, uh, they, they would have they clean the guns, they'd have gun drills, uh, they would do other things. They had classes. A lot. We had a lot of classes. Uh, for education, we occupied. I mean, in other words, if if you we had a gr whole group of people, like I told you earlier, that we tried to get to fourth grade. We had a lot of people in, that I met, soldiers who were drafted from Kentucky and Tennessee, particularly in those areas, who couldn't read and write, or very very limited. You, you know what I'm talking about. And we had to teach them how to read and write, and to get them to the fourth grade and do math. Had no idea when they used to get paid. They'd have a friend. They used to get a few, a little bit on cash. The rest was sent to an account, and and, and they would have difficulty, honestly, going to counting out twenty bucks. 
you know, and I thought, you're just counting it. And then we had another group that was from four, was eighth grade education. And then we had another group that was high school. Those were the three things. That's what General Taylor wanted to do. That also kept the troops busy going to school and doing something productive besides shining up artillery shells. I mean, you know, and that's what we did. Now, I, I've uh, learned a lot to, to today speaking with you. I don't know how you could possibly do it. It wasn't very exciting. I'm going to tell you war stories. I mean, I have none of them. No, no, but is, is there anything you'd like to add that we haven't recorded so far? Anything, a story? Any, I, oh, I mean, I got a million stories. You kidding? About stories? Oh, my God. Um, so did you guys ever do any pranks on each other? Any what? Did you guys have any pranks that you used to pull on each other? For yeah, I'm too old for pranks. Oh. Yeah, I'll tell you what a prank. I'll, okay, well, I'll, I'll, give, it, I'll give you a couple of stories. I, when I was in Japan, you had an opportunity to buy cars. You could buy a car. But in Japan, the roads were very narrow. See, the trail, the, most of the transportation is by rail. Now, now it's great, I understand. And so the speed limit was 25 miles an hour. So, so anyway, I used to get the New York Times a week late. No, that wasn't even a week late, actually. I used to get the New York Times by airmail about Tuesday, the Sunday edition of Tuesday, and I used to read the New York Times because they had a deal. I, didn't, I got it for nothing from the Army. So in there one day there was an ad, and Macy's was selling Crosley cars. Crosley used to be a dishwasher make, dish washer maker and stuff in Cincinnati. Crosley Field, the baseball field, named after them. They make cars, Crosleys. The car was probably as big as this table. And the car sold for 200. It said, the, the ad said, you bought the car, we'll ship anywhere. So I sent them a telegram telling them I was in Yokohama and I wanted to take advantage of your car for $242. And they said, okay, they would ship it to me anywhere if I could use my name in the advertising that they shipped the car to me. I said, that was fine. So they shipped me this Crosley car, which was about, honestly, God, the coolest thing you've ever seen. I mean, it's much smaller. I'm trying to think of that new car that came out, the smart car. Well, it would be like the size of a smart car, except not as high uh, and a little bit longer. And, and they shipped me this little car, little roadster. And... Uh, the thing used to be, when I used to drive it around, that it, the, in the beginning I used to park it, say, in front of the officer's club, I'd come out and couldn't find it because it was so light, Two guys, four guys could pick it up. Now I used to have to take a chain like you do with a bicycle and chain the wheel to a lamppost so they wouldn't take my car. And then uh, another, a couple of other, I, you know, funny things. I don't know, I, I'm just thinking about uh, in uh, Yokohama, I did go down to, uh, I used to go to Kamakura. Kamakura is where the big Buddha is. There's a big, big Buddha, people go there. It was a black marketing center. That's the first time I ever met a, a Russian soldier, officer. They were sightseeing. They were Russian soldiers, you know, in Tokyo, and they went sightseeing. I mean, we shook hands, uh, no conversation, obviously. And then the guy said to me something he wanted to know about gin. And I didn't know what he was talking about. And then uh, they used to like gin and, and vodka that was their drink, but they liked gin too. And I never got to it. So I came back and I asked somebody, and they said, well, if you had a bottle of gin, he would buy it from you. Now, I used to buy a bottle of gin, it used to cost 80 cents. You no taxes. And you could get a case or something, you know, and then I never thought much about it. And then you used to, you could sell it for like five bucks. And he would have bought your gin from me, but I never knew what he was talking about. He used to do a lot of selling of cigarettes. I had cartons of cigarettes. I, used, I don't smoke cigarettes. So I used to get two cartons of cigarettes, and I used to trade them for the ivories you see here and the pictures, and I got scrolls and, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of junk. I gave most a lot of it away. And that's what I used to go shopping, you know, Japanese stores. And, and I know that you have some photographs that you're going to let us yeah, well, those are those little photographs over there that I had from uh, West Point and mm -hmm. one from Japan and I think some when I was in the Army mm -hmm. that you can peruse. And uh, they're not going to show you very much. I don't even have one. I don't think I even have one with a helmet on, though I used to have to wear that. Well, we didn't wear our helmets. In Korea, 
after once the truce was signed, uh, we weren't required to wear the helmets because, uh, you know, supposedly we're at quote unquote peace. Mm -hmm. So I could wear my little cap instead of the helmets are pain in the neck. They're heavy and they're not very, they're, now they look like, I see them now with they entirely different fitted, you know, lighter. And um, we did have an uh, unfortunate experience in Korea. We had a lake, a pond. And one day in August, or not August, April, um, I wasn't a witness to it. Um, it got to be, it got 93 degrees out. Don't ask me, a freak in April in Korea. And two guys decided they would like to go swimming in this little pond. It, it, the pond was very good. I mean, it, in the summertime, it was great. They could go swimming in it. It was a deep water little pond in the hills. And the two of them, unfortunately, they dove in the pond, and the pond was at about 12, 12 degrees, and both had heart attacks and died. It was unbelievable. I, I didn't see it all, and it wasn't. It was in one of the battalions. It wasn't in my unit. It was in another uh, another battalion in our unit, in our area, in our division artillery which was unfortunate. And I, how, how we ever got around those mountains without automobile accidents, I'll never know, but they did have some, but it was perilous driving. It's like driving over Avon Mountain with no guardrails. You know, and a, a, you know, you look down and... Um, now is, is the, uh, the TV series or the movie... MASH? Dash? It was funny, it was a takeoff. I mean, it was a takeoff. Uh, that we had a Swedish match, believe it or not, mm -hmm. uh, in our area, you know, with doctors and nurses, and if you got sick, you went there. Mm -hmm. That's what it was, Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. Mm -hmm. And then if you got sick, we had an infirmary. If you got beyond our infirmary, that's where you went. And I mean, it's a comedy, you know. Yeah, well, no, I know this yeah, series is a comedy. Yeah, but that's the way, a lot of, you know, I, 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 like I, I, I rode up in a Jeep illegally, like they picked up a Jeep when they were there. I mean, obviously, this, the whole thing's a, but it, it was okay. Yeah, it was like that. Yeah, we had what that was there. I'm trying to think of other little things that happened. There were so few things that happened, you know, that I that I uh, can relate to. Um, but you know, Korea was pretty boring. I mean, it's very boring. That that was the problem after World War II, one, you know, and that's why after World War II they instituted all these things for the troops because. They, they were bored out of their minds, and when they get bored, then they tend to drink. And uh, 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 where we were, there were no girls, so that was not a problem. But it would be a problem in another area, you know. They get in a lot of trouble, and um, so it, it was, you know we just we worked very hard at that, uh, keeping people busy doing something. Mm -hmm. Me too. But uh, you know, as I say, the reason I I, I feel embarrassed again and I'll say it a hundred times is I really was not in World War two and I don't really consider myself a veteran of World War two even though other people think I am and I got a medal for being in the United States uh, I don't consider being at West Point being an active uh, I wasn't chasing anybody with a gun and being active and I, I certainly had a very sheltered life up there you know so, what other, any other questions? No, I don't have any other questions, so you've answered um, things that I didn't even have to ask. Well, the thing is, Very you know, good. and my, my son-in-law, I think when he called up for the project, doing his father, mm -hmm. he said, well, you, you, you should interview my father-in-law because he's an interesting character. Well, now you've interviewed me. And you are an interesting but, character. But I mean, I just, it's different. You know, everybody else you're going to talk about, you're going to see. My, my, my relatives were in the CBs, and they did this, and the other people were in Europe, and the other people were in, in, in the Far East, and they were, you know, they, I think now, I think they're dying off now. Uh, you know, you notice that they're getting old, the, what they call the great generation. The generation. Well, basically, if you started, if you were 20 years old in 1940, uh, you're now uh, over 90. And so, you know, they're not going to live forever. Mm -hmm. And the things they did were remarkable. And eventually we won, thanks to the atomic bomb. That was the other problem. <clears throat> That's the other thing that was, that I don't know if people realize, that one of the things I was trained for was the fact is that under the war plans that they had, in, when I was at West Point, the timetable that they had set up was that we were being invaded 
Japan probably in late 1946 would be invading Japan. And of course, they did the atomic bomb. It was going to take a year to build up the troops to invade Japan because they had about 300,000 homeland troops there that you had to go ferret out. It wasn't going to be like walking in town and saying, here we are. It would be like going into, into uh, you know, into Europe, like D-Day. But unfortunately, we didn't have to do that. And that was the reason they dropped the atomic bomb was because they didn't want to lose another 50,000 lives, you know. And, and so uh, that was that. Okay, well. Well, I thank you very much. And thank you well, thanks for coming.